Okay, now I think I'm now recording this next section. And I'm hoping that you, you at home have joined us. And um, for those of you, uh, we will have this posted. If I can pull this down, there we go. I think that's better. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the um, endocrine system. Okay, well. Without further ado, I'm just going to carry on with uh, with uh, the endocrine problems. And so, a lot of the, the a lot of the uh, endocrine problems that you're going to see relate to diabetes. And we'll do a, a, a session on diabetes, but we'll also talk about uh, hypothyroidism. That is probably one of the most common ones you're going to see. Some of the other endocrine disorders that we probably talked about in patho, such as hypo or hyperaldosteronism, um, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Some of them, they're more advanced. Yes, and patients that experience those conditions will most likely be in the intensive care unit. If you get a patient out of the ICU onto the medical surgical floors um, with those conditions, you know, look it up at that point, but that's nothing that we need to talk about right now. I do, um, as I mentioned to you, I just want to make sure that you're aware of the common things that you'll be experiencing. And so, disorders of the thyroid gland and you'll see a lot of that i'm finding it quite prevalent disorders of the thyroid gland you'll see that there is a real spectrum with what they refer to as youth thyroid youth thyroid and anything that has an eu as the prefix means it's neutral or equal so if you're euvolemic you have an equal intake and output. Um, thyroid means that your thyroid is normal. Whereas if you have a low thyroid level, which is considered hypothyroidism, or more, more severely, mixed edema coma is people that are severely um, hypothyroid. Uh, to Welcome. Um, to all the way to um, hyperthyroid or a thyroid storm. And it's a, it's a wide gamut. So patients that have um, experienced hyperthyroid, you may see that they have a goiter. And these are things, you know, you know as I mentioned, you know, um, when you're in the, the grocery store, you're standing in, behind somebody or in front of somebody, you're going to see them with this, this swollen neck hair, and you're thinking, they've got a goiter. Um, you know, or I, when I'm in the grocery store, I think about the people in front of me uh, looking at their ears. Uh, are they on their head at the correct interval? Because you know how the other cancels the eye. The ear should just graze the, uh, that line. And so you start to think of all these things. I know it's kind of crazy. I have to pass the time somehow. And so you're going to see patients like this. And they'll often have this wide-eyed stare. We call that wide-eyed stare of, of hyperthyroidism, exothalamism. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, drugs that are prescribed for, and let me just come along here. Um, so I think I'll go to um, my slide right here on hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism, again, is when the body secretes too much thyroid hormone. And that can create, so I think of it as being anything that's going to cause the system to increase and speed up. So that this is the patient that's going to be tremulous. They can't stop moving. They have heart palpitations. Um, and that can be as, as a result of um, Graves' disease or of uh, this, what they refer to as this toxic goiter. So they have that swollen area. And it can come on quite suddenly. Typically, it occurs in, in females, um, more in the middle-aged range. And so they, are, they experience tachycardia, hypertension, headache, weight loss. Um, they, if, it's a, if it's been going over a period of time, they have this extreme nervousness. They just feel very edgy. And, um, and so they'll, they'll seek out uh, their family's physician and the family physician will say, well, let's do, do your diagnostic studies and they'll find that they have hyperthyroidism. Uh, it could be. We see a lot of this as a result of, of 
of hyperthyroidism uh, as a result of uh, dietary intake of iodine. And so anyway, so with the clinical manifestations of tachycardia, tremulous, nervousness, weight loss, um, the diagnostic test that would be completed would be T3, T4, to actually measure the levels, but also thyroid stimulating hormone. If I said TSH, does that make sense to you? Have you covered that in school in, in Apollo? So that whole negative feedback loop. And so they would do a TSH, do a T3 and T4, just to see if their levels are elevated. Um, the big concern is that the, the cardiac, uh, the effects of cardiac uh, with these elevated T4 levels. So hyperthyroidism um, will require medications to prevent them going into that thyroid storm, as I mentioned at the beginning. And so the drug that they're going to give are anti-thyroid drugs. The most common one is known by its acronym PTU or propofiosol. Propofiosol. PTU is easier to say. And, and it just diminishes the, the function of the thyroid. Iodine also diminishes the action of thyroid. And so what happens with these people that develop these goiters, they will actually do a, um, a radioactive, up, a radioactive uh, iodine uptake test to see how the thyroid actually uptakes the iodine. And sometimes that, that is just enough to uh, the, the amount of iodine that they actually drink. They put it into the water juice, they drink it to see how their, if their thyroid is actually enlarged. They, uh, that iodine might be sufficient enough to actually damage the thyroid. And so it kills a bit of the thyroid gland, and then their thyroid levels are normal. Uh, patients that are hyperthyroid, they're tremulous, they're shaking, they're moving, they're tacky, they're breathing fast, they're nervous and edgy, and so they really need to, something that's going to slow down their heart rate. And so once their heart rate is down, that helps. And so oftentimes um, they would take a beta adrenergic blocker or a beta blocker. And uh, an example of a beta blocker would be uh, metoprolol, or in fact, they use a very old beta blocker. It's called, the name is called Indurol or Propanolol, but they could also use metoprolol. They would target the thyroid to, to kill off some of the hyperactive tissue, and so they would give radioactive iodine, not only for diagnostic purposes, but they'd also give it for um, therapeutic purposes. They may also go ahead uh, with surgical intervention. Did anyone care for a patient that had a thyroidectomy on your floor? And so um, there are some of the surgical units that do a thyroidectomy, and I have to say, um, they make me nervous, thyroidectomies. You know, they send them home nowadays after the surgery. They just discharge them. Um, I used to always have the uh, difficult airway tray because that's the most serious complication is that they're going to end up with an airway compromise, that there's going to have swelling at their throat um, and, and close in on the larynx, and so they will be, have a compromised airway. And once if you cannot see the vocal cords, it's difficult to intubate the patient. So we would have the special trays at the bedside just in case. This is the patient that's going to be nursed in a semi-fowlers or high-fowlers position, so you want gravity to pull all the fluid down from the neck. If they're lying sort of semi-fowlers to low-fowlers, all that fluid just accumulates, and it's like a big constriction around their throat. So you want the patient to be um, uh, kept up in an upright position. Uh, when this patient comes back from surgery, and again, you, you know, pay particular attention, this, this surgical procedure, because of the nature of it, um, you want to stay with your patient and do a very close observation. So the patient is kept in the semi fellers to high fellers position, and you're going to go through your ABCs. Always, always, always assess your ABCs. And if you don't know what to do, assess your ABCs. There's only one time that you do not assess your ABCs, and that's when somebody is unresponsive and has coded, in which case you're going to assess CAB. Every other time is your ABCs, and we call that our primary survey. You're gonna start with your primary assessment of the airway. Um, Leslie, are you okay? Yeah, I think I am. 
and they're going to be, you know, as long as they can talk, you know, their airway is patent. Um, I want to make sure that air is going down and their chest is rising and falling. Um, and you, if you're having difficulty with that, you may just want to just gently place your hand. Did they tell you that in foundation, just gently place your hand on their chest? We don't do that for everyone. As you get more experience, you're able to see the chest rise and fall. But for people that you're very worried about, just put your hand gently on their chest to see their chest rise and fall. Uh, and letting the patient know that you don't, that, you know, and getting permission. So you want to assess their airway, their breathing, and their circulation. Always check the dressing around the back of the neck. Remember that this, these dressings are right at the crook, so, and typically they've got thick, thick necks. Like every, and so now you've got this thick neck with the dressing all the way across that you're trying to just keep it stuck on. And um, so you, will, you want to make sure that you can just sort of gently see that the, the dressing is dry and look behind the neck because it can seep down the fold of the neck and you can lose blood that way. So always assess your ABCs, um, checking this patient's airway breathing and that, that they're not hemorrhaging behind. Again, pain management is a concern, but I, in my experience, it wasn't as concerning. And it's more um, that, and they also may have a hemovac as well. Does everyone know what a, a hemovac or a JP is, AP drain? So it's those little, what did the doctor call it? A grenade. I'm not sure I like the term grenade, but it is a grenade or an egg shaped that you keep squished and a little plug in so that it has a gentle suction. So Hemovac or, or a Jackson Pratt drain. These patients may have that, so you want to be watching for the bleeding through that as well. And then uh, with their nutritional therapy, uh, nutritional therapy, you want to be sure that uh, after the surgery, of course, that they are on soft fluids and that they are avoiding um, what they're avoiding with any kind of, I think it's just soft fluids, making sure that they're able to drink. They may have to hold their head up because they have no control because their neck has been, uh, is opened. Um, hyperthyroidism, uh, I think we've talked about the assessment um, with, Acute interventions after thyroid surgery, acute thyroid toxicosis or thyroid storm. This is after surgery and the hormones just go all askew. So they're they're just randomly, they're high and then they'll be low. And the, the biggest thing is you want to do is to prevent um, this acute thyroid storm. And it occurs in a small percentage of the people that you just want to be observing it for, looking for that tachycardia, um, looking for that nervousness and restlessness. Uh, and that is considered um, a th acute thyroid toxicosis or thyroid storm. Um, Post-operative care is the usual. Again, you wanna make sure that they're ambulating, that they're deep breathing and coughing. Um, you don't want them to cough too hard until the incision is really healed, but making sure that they're ambulating. Hypothyroidism. Um, hypothyroidism, or they this patient is actually quite hypothyroid, and, and it's a picture of a patient that has um, mixed edema. And so, because of the lack of thyroid hormones, they're they're very clouded in their thinking, very fuzzy. They um, they are uh, lacking. Um, any, they're, they're very fatigued, they can hardly get themselves up, they are putting on, they have a lot of edema, uh, they have, um, they're quite bradycardic, their skin and nails are quite thick, and signs of, of hypothyroidism. What else I want to mention about hypothyroidism? Uh, again, just the, the, the diagnostic test would be your T3, T4, and TSH. Um, and this is a patient that would require thyroid supplementation. The medication that they would be probably ordered would be Synthroid. Synthroid is quite widely prescribed and has a very long half-life. And so if patients miss it for a day in the hospital, we use, sometimes we couldn't get them to get it in. They couldn't swallow because of their surgery or whatever. And so we would um, try and get into them the, the next day, but there's really no IV or IM preparation that you can use. The IV is very expensive, so oftentimes they'll just miss it for that day. Uh, I think that's really all I wanted to focus on for this is just really around hypo and hyperthyroidism, uh, the diagnostic test to discern which, is, which it is, 
the hyperthyroidism, clinical manifestations is everything that's, you know, the get up and go. They're too hyperstimulated. Uh, and whereas the myxedema, as you can see, everything is slowed right down, mental acuity included. They, their metabolism is slow. They put on weight. Uh, they have no uh, motivation to get up and move around. So you can see how that affects the patient. And so, but the most important thing I wanted to talk about is, I don't think I pulled it up here, is diabetes. And so, because you will be seeing a lot of diabetes. Just one second here. I'll have to re reactivate. Yeah. And I'm trying to find the one that is the very, I think this is it. I think this is the short version of it. So uh, at least I'm hoping so. And again, please, please do not. Now, I'm trying to find my other PowerPoint here. So oh, I want to new share. Thank you for being so agreeable while I uh, sort through all this. Oh, here it is right here. OK. So uh, this, this particular PowerPoint, as you'll notice, is 130 slides long. Don't panic because there's a, several of them just have one word on them. So I just wanted to highlight that. We're going to go through it quite quickly. I think this is common knowledge. And from this point forward, you'll be building on. So don't take a note. Just listen. Uh, if I say it's important, then put it down. Every word that's going to come out of my mouth is on the slide. And you're thinking, then why am I sitting here? Uh, but I do, it's important to, to have a discussion around diabetes. It's one of those uh, burdens of disease that you're going to see quite often in our healthcare system. And we have to do a better job of managing uh, diabetes. So it's a, diabetes is a chronic multi-system disease and it's related to abnormal insulin production or impaired uh, insulin utilization. So there's some barrier to getting that glucose into the cell. Um, it is the leading cause of end-stage renal failure. And just as we were saying, um, diabetes causes chronic renal failure. Uh, diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in adults, as well as um, amputations, lower leg amputations. And I've got some great pictures there for you. And so it has a huge burden of disease on our society. So um, these lower um, the amputations, I was quite shocked a number of years ago, the number of amputees in the Oshawa region. And not just at the hospital, they were everywhere. There was all these young people in cars. I thought, well, maybe they were like um, traumas or motorcycle accidents or something. No, these were all people that had diabetes and had lost their leg. And I've seen where it started as just a little blip, a uh, gangrenous toe that we put the back dressing on um, and it just uh, ascended right up the leg. So we took off, at, we are just are um, amputated at the ankle. So that at least they can put some kind of a prosthesis then below the knee and then they just are articulated at the hip. So it's really quite, it's very tragic, the complications from it. Uh, it's the major com contributing factor to heart disease and stroke. And so you're dealing with a patient who has all these health challenges and then they've got chronicity such as diabetes. So uh, the etiology of diabetes, and a lot is coming forward around this. There's some theories. There's no one um, definitive uh, cause, but they're linking it to genetic uh, disorders, autoimmune disorders, some viruses, uh, as well as environmental. So they're looking at, uh, is there some kind of an autoimmune disorder in the uh, island of Langerhans in the pancreas? Uh, they're looking at some kind of a, a viral exposure in utero, but environmental is really a big concern because of the diet and the sedentary lifestyle of some of our, of our youth. We used to see diabetes type 1. You might see some uh, 
children, you know, four to six developing it, sort of later, maybe eight. Mom takes the, the child to the doctors because they're having polyuria or frequency in urination, and they find out they're a type 1 diabetic. Type 2 diabetes, you wouldn't see maybe a 50-year-old, 60-year-old. We're seeing type 2 diabetes in 10-year-olds. That is concerning because I just told you that diabetes is the number one cause of blindness, kidney failure, amputations, and we're seeing this now in, in 10 year olds. So we really have to be uh, astute to um, health promotion strategies. Uh, two of the most common causes of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, we're moving away from non-insulin dependent and, and insulin dependent, you might hear those terms, uh, we're moving away from those because of the new regimens now. At one time, type 1 was, was, non -insulin, was insulin dependent, type 2 was non-insulin dependent, and, and never the two shall mix. However, we know now that it's all about good glycosemic control. And so if you need to have a little snitch of insulin, people are on oral agents and then also having a small um, bolus dose of insulin once a day. So that, that theory is not is not um, holding, bearing forth like it once did. So type one and type two, uh, we also are seeing gestational diabetes. So moms that are developing diabetes during pregnancy, um, they, that is, and you'll learn about this next semester, they end up with really big um, baby because at the, the last trimester, they have really high glucose levels. And so these babies grow like crazy. So these are 10 pound, 12 pound babies. Puts them at a higher risk of developing diabetes later on in life. Pre-diabetes. Put a little highlight around that. Um, Pre-diabetes is a condition that, that again, we, this is really important for us as healthcare providers. We want to target this patient with a pre-diabetes so we can actually prevent them from going on to develop full-blown diabetes. So pre-diabetes is when they're, the glucose, um, fasting glucose may be around 6.2. So it's at the upper end of normal, still normal, but they're consistently at the higher end of normal. So that was that, those pre-diabetes. Secondary diabetes, um, and again, I don't think that's even a, a real term, but if, if I was asked to define it, secondary diabetes is when someone might be on a steroid, and they're not really diabetic, but because of the other conditions associated with steroid use, because of that, their sugars have increased. Uh, normal insulin metabolism is produced by the beta cells in the pancreas, the islets, and Langerhans, and they're released continuously into the bloodstream in small increments with, uh, with larger amounts released after our meals. Glucose stabilizes in around the 4 to 6 millimole per liter range. So that would be, it would be normal 4 to 6. Uh, this diagram gives you sort of a little... Uh, an idea of what normal insulin production would look like. So um, just before breakfast, you get a little burst and then you can tolerate your breakfast and then a little at lunch and then at dinner and it stays, or you have your dinner and then your, your blood glucose stays, uh, is a little bit elevated while the insulin is being secreted. And then you can see it drops again. Um, insulin promotes glucose transport from the bloodstream across the cell membrane. So that it almost, uh, insulin is like a little, I see it like a little uh, boat that's going to take glucose into the cell. So it's the carrier into the cell. So, um, and if you think of the sugar being taken from the bloodstream, so I'm going to take this molecule and put it in the cell. I'm going to take this one. And, and so it's decreasing serum glucose, but increasing it into the cell. So insulin increases after a meal. It stimulates storage of glucose as glycogen. And uh, you know, remember all of that gluconeogenesis? Did you talk about that in patho as well? I know it's hard. It probably was a couple months ago. And so we do get gluconeogenesis um, in the liver and the muscle. Um, uh, insulin inhibits it. It keeps it stored. Um, enhances fat deposit. So you'll find that patients are, especially type two diabetics, have a lot of fat deposits uh, and increases protein synthesis. Uh, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue are insulin dependent tissues. Other tissues do not use, um, they, they need that uh, glucose uh, for, 
uh, depend on um, do not directly depend on insulin for glucose transport. They use the sugar in a different format. But skeletal muscle and adipose tissue require insulin to actually metabolize that sugar for that for the cells to work. Um, type one diabetes, we used to call that juvenile because, as I mentioned, it's usually you know not the younger um, adolescent or the younger youth at school age, and then the adolescent juvenile uh, onset or insulin dependent. Now we've moved away from that. Most often occurs in younger people, younger than forty years of age. I was going to say younger than forty, and yet occurs in children. So occurs more frequently in young children. The, it's it's uh, usually the end result of a long-standing process where there's some kind of, something, whether it's an autoimmune response, that there's destruction of the um, uh, the island of Langerhans, so that uh, autoimmune destruction of the pancreas. Uh, they've developed some antibodies, and so whatever is happening is decreasing the, the action of the pancreas, those islands of Langerhans. Um, and again, we talked about it. I don't want you to get too hung up just to know that it's multifactorial. They, they don't know exactly what's causing it, but there is an autoimmune component to it, genetic predisposition. Uh, there is also the, saying that they could be exposed to uh, a virus. So there is a long preclinical period before it actually, you have symptoms of it. So this is happening in the child well beyond, before that it's uh, their symptoms. And then there's something that, that tips them and then they will have this rapid onset of symptoms. So they often present and they emerge with ketoacidosis. That's a very life-threatening condition uh, when your body, there's no, there's no longer the body can, um, is not able to use regular glucose getting that into the cell and so it starts to break down fat or uh, food source or fuel source energy source, and once they start to break down that fat, then you switch to a different type of metabolism, and you have this lactic acidosis, and remember what we said, the heart does not like an acidotic environment. So this patient will require, um, they refer to it as an exogenous or an external source of insulin for the rest of their life. And so, um, and so, yeah, we've talked about diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, Pre-diabetes, as we mentioned, is already someone who's at risk of developing diabetes, but the blood glucose is not as high as someone, so it's not greater, you know, 10, 15, but it's just in that range, like 6.2, 6.7, in that upper range. And this is a patient you want to target for health promotion. You know, start that low glycemic diet so they don't go on to, to develop diabetes. Uh, impaired glucose fasting and impaired glucose tolerance. Now, generally, they do just glucose tolerance. Uh, they do fasting glucose, and then a, a hemoglobin A1C, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, well, one time, they used to do this glucose tolerance test, where they give somebody a really sweet, sweet glass of, of uh, glucose to drink, and then they see how at uh, different time intervals what their sugar is, how their body metabolizes. They do a neural glucose tolerance test with uh, pregnant mothers. Uh, that's standard procedure. Uh, so, pre-diabetes would be anyone considered 6.1 to 6.9. Um, don't worry about the two-hour glucose levels, but just so you know that they're elevated. And hemoglobin A1c is another marker for how well that patient's glucose has been controlled. And so, the, the um, sugar is carried, so they, they can tell by these markers on the hemoglobin, and the lifespan of the hemoglobin is three months. So that's how they tell what the hemoglobin A1C is, so how well that sugar was controlled in the last three months. And it should be um, less than seven. Uh, Pre-diabetes, as I mentioned, they've already had long-term damage starting to occur, and that's why it's really important to, get, to really target that for your health promotion. Yeah, watching for typical classic signs of diabetes, polyuria, polyphagia, polydipsia. So they're, they are thirsty, they're voiding frequently, and they're hungry because they have no fuel source. So they're just burning everything. Uh, diabetes, so diabetes types one uh, is responsible, it accounts for about 10% of all diabetics. Although it's probably all the, the patients that you see that are diabetic are will be type one. 
Um, Diabetic type 2 account for about 90% of the patients with diabetes. They're generally older, but we're seeing them now, children that are in their teens now with type 2 diabetes. And as you can see, that uh, a large portion are overweight, sedentary lifestyle, uh, you know, computer games, a uh, lot of screen time. Uh, fast food diets, and so, and we see a lot of this, which is very tragic, with our uh, indigenous populations up in our in, up north. Uh, prevalence of type two diabetes increases with age. There is a genetic predisposition. Um, however, I think that you need to have those conditions, such as sedentary lifestyle, poor diet, uh, lack of exercise as well. And then there's a genetic, as I mentioned, Aboriginal, Hispanic, South uh, Asian, and African. The pancreas continues to produce some insulin, a little bit, but it's not enough to be uh, not enough to sustain that patient, that person. Uh, also, there is something that's causing it's a, there's some kind of uh, insulin barrier. There's something that's blocking that door that's not allowing that that insulin to carry the glucose in. There's something insulin resistance, and that's becoming quite a phenomenon now. That insulin resistance. Um, there is also um, um, that you'll see abdominal obesity. There's this thing called metabolic syndrome, and I'm not sure if you've heard of it before. It's kind of, you'll hear that term used. I, I, I was new to that term, and I think it came out about eight years ago. And it really, metabolic syndrome is a constellation of symptoms. It's not, I said, I've never had a patient admitted with metabolic syndrome. It's just a constellation of symptoms that puts this patient at higher risk to develop cardiac, cardiovascular disease. And what that would include would be abdominal obesity. And so they were, that one, the heart and stroke actually had everybody sent out measuring tapes so you can measure their, their bellies. Um, and if they have a, if it was over, I think, 110 centimeters for a man and 90 centimeters for a woman, they would be considered having abdominal obesity. And then, um, put in a higher risk factor, but it also includes high cholesterol, high blood sugar, hypertension, high lipids. So it's all of that package. Is that surprising to anyone? Those sort of travel together, all of those pieces. So uh, with type two diabetes, there's uh, insulin resistance. So the body doesn't respond the same to insulin. And so they don't know whether that's just they don't have enough little spots to allow the insulin to be brought into the cell maybe the, all the doors are shut um, or what's the, or it's just that the sugars is too the sugar is just way too high I can't manage all of all of the sugar uh, or is the pancreas not even producing enough insulin so if it was producing you know 30 mils per hour of, of insulin now it's down to like five and so not, not producing enough insulin. Um, and if you can imagine beta cell fatigue, I, I don't know what a beta cell fatigue would look like, but just knowing that there, the pancreas is now being overwhelmed and not able to produce enough in inappropriate glucose production from the liver. So the liver is now jumping in and, and it's breaking down and having gluconeogenesis, throwing in some sugar as well. So there's lots of reasons why you have elevated sugar. Oh, and this is a new concept as well. And again, nothing is going to be on the test, um, but something to tuck away that there's an alteration in the production of hormones and this uh, adipokines. And so there's all this research around because bariatrics is such a specialty now uh, and such a concern. Um, and so looking at uh, the role of leptin in uh, contributing to bariatric patients. Individuals with metabolic syndrome we've talked about are at increased risk. Um, we talked about that. Uh, onset of disease. Um, so with patients with diabetes, so diabetes types one, that they're they're eventually just going to you know they have polydipsia, polyuria. Um, there's something that tips them; they go into ketoacidosis. And again, very 
is these patients will have fast, rapid respirations in ketoacidosis. Talk about more in year four, but for our they have this, with it for this Kushmal respiration, they're breathing, they have this fruity breath smell, um, they're, they're hot to touch, they're, they're very flushed, um, they're very dehydrated, parched, 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 parched. Their lips are just cracked. Are so dry and the treatment is that we just dump in liters and liters and liters of fluid um, it's quite surprising you'd be shocked at how much fluid we get and so that's for people with type diabetes types 1 people with diabetes types 2 because their pancreas is still secreting number five whatever per liter just a little bit they don't experience the ketoacidosis the same and so they actually have this uh, uh, osmotic and electrolyte shift and they have um, what they refer to as this hyper, profound hyperglycemia. They never get it um, to the point, that because there's always a little bit of, of insulin secretion, there's a little bit. It never goes into anaerobic metabolism. So with type 1 diabetes, they present as ketoacidosis. Type 2, they, type, they present as hyperosmolar, non-ketotic ketoacidosis. So it's a hyperosmolar state. So they have high blood sugars, they're unresponsive, and this is quite, quite um, de uh, deleterious to the older adult. This can kill them. Everybody hanging in? I, am, I don't usually um, have you know, this many PowerPoints, but are you hanging in okay? Feel free to leave. If you've had enough, I know when your brain is just like can hardly fit through the door. You want at home, you can just put me on pause till you want to come back, but these folks can't. So it's whatever you'd like to do. Please don't feel obligated to stay. Uh, so uh, so I just wanted to highlight that again. Diabetic ketoacidosis is more prevalent in patients with diabetic, uh, diabetic type 1, insulin dependent, uh, whereas non-ketotic hyperosmolar ketoacidosis is type 2 because they have a little bit of insulin secreted. Uh, gestational diabetes, let's skip it. You'll learn about that next semester. Uh, we've already talked about um, secondary diabetes, but just to know that there may be other reasons, if, even if they're not diagnosed as, as diabetic. Uh, classic signs of diabetes type 1 that we talked about is polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. That might be something to remember. And don't get mixed up with the other polys either. Make sure it's polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. Um, the patients will experience weight loss because they don't have any fuel. They're using that fat as fuel. They're very weak and they experience great levels of fatigue. Type 2, on the other hand, have the their, their sugars are elevated, but they do have a little bit of, of insulin. And so they are fatigued, they have recurrent infections, so they might have um, a yeast, a vaginal yeast infection or oral yeast. They, patients with diabetes have prolonged wound healing. So if you have somebody that has a, a wound that's just not um, approximating nicely, consider that they might be diabetic and check their sugars. Diabetes, I think we've talked about already. The four methods of diagnosing a diabetic is through um, a fasting or random blood sugar. A fasting blood sugar greater than seven, because remember, pre diabetes is that like 6.1 to 6.9. Uh, seven and greater would be considered fasting, would be considered diabetes, and a hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5%. Those are typically, you don't see as many oral glucose tolerance tests. Um, and again, I've talked about that. So we've talked about our hemoglobin A1C as being a marker for diabetic control over three months. So the patients always come in and say, yeah, my sugars have been five for the last month. And then you look at their hemoglobin A1C and it's 8%. So you know right away that they've not had the good control you'd hoped. Uh, goals of diabetic... Happy holidays, Merry Christmas. Uh, goals of diabetic management, they have decreased, so the goal is to decrease the um, hyperglycemia, really promote well-being and a good quality of life and prevent acute complications and delaying any of those complications that we talked about, such as blindness, um, retinopathy, nephropathy, which is that uh, kidney involvement, neuropathy, which is that nerve involvement of the feet, um, and, and I know the opathies, so the eyes, the kidneys, and distal uh, feet.
feet. You want to delay any uh, complications. Uh, patient teaching will include glucose monitoring. And do remember, um, for those of you who are with us, um, that when you're doing your glucose, I wish, wish I had a little slide on that. Um, when you're doing your glucose tests now, it depends on the type of technology you're using. So sometimes it's just a matter of washing their hands with soap and water. You don't want to use the pad of their finger. You want to use the side of their finger because it's very, very tender. And so just use the side of their finger to uh, check their sugar or to, to get a drop of blood to check their glucose. Um, insulin. Um, and again, that's an exogenous store of, of insulin. I, I just, you will know nothing different, but I want to say insulin has evolved quite significantly over the last 40 years. Quite incredible how it's um, really becoming quite sophisticated. For your purposes, I just want you to know that there's four different classifications. So there's immediate acting, there is um, or rapid acting, they're short acting, there's intermediate acting, and long acting. So those are the different types of insulins. And so you just need to know when they peak. Uh, I just want to also flag that the only insulin that you will give intravenously is, a, is the short acting insulin. There's no other insulin that you can give. Um, and just uh, know generally when they peak. So rapid acting is 15 minutes. Short acting is 30 minutes, intermediate is six to eight hours. Um, long acting is there is no peak, or that extended acting, there is no peak. And I just want to highlight that that was one thing I learned that giving that long acting insulin, such as Lantus, I'd never heard of giving insulin at bedtime. That was just unheard of, and I was very uncomfortable doing it until somebody explained to me there is no peak. It gives a, it's just, it's a nice long, long acting dose where you don't have that peak that you do with other insulin. So feel very safe in giving that long acting insulin at bedtime when patients are not eating. Um, long acting is given once a day, whatever the regimen be, they'll follow the sugars and some people will get it first thing in the morning. Well, they'll get it first thing in the morning, but they may get a dose again at, at, at dinner time. Um, I think we've covered that, the important piece is that. Oh, yes, don't, uh, long acting cannot be mixed with any other insulin. Short acting insulins can be mixed with other insulins. And so just be familiar with how to, did you remember that from your pharmacology where you mix the short acting and intermediate acting insulin and you inject air in the short acting, or in the intermediate, then the short, you flip up and you withdraw the short acting. You're not doing that this year? Okay. Okay. So that so that's good to know because what we'll do then is in year three, I'll make sure I do it with my with simulation for the people coming into me. But for you folks, I'll make sure we incorporate that in our year three steps so that you have that opportunity to practice that. Good point. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, insulin, you can you have to be careful how you store it. Uh, can't be left at room temperature. I mean, frozen. Some of the files now can be left at, at room temperature for up to four weeks. So you'll find in the hospital that they're kept in the refrigerator, and they bring out one vial that sits on the counter, and it's a multi-dose vial. Don't use any multi-dose vial that is not labeled and dated. So they'll use a, a vial. Um, there's policies. It shouldn't be open longer than 90 days. Uh, yeah, 90 days. So make sure that that is, has been documented or else throw it out and get another one. I would not use an, a vial that had not been late, labeled because you don't know if it's been like that for six months. So it's been a year. So only use, and when, when you open a new vial, make sure that you date it and initial it. Insulin, again, I think. I think we've talked about, so uh, insulin therapy, as you know, it's given sub-Q. The needles are very fine nowadays. The insulin needles didn't used to be like that, and they'd have like great big lumps. We called it um, very woody. It'd be like going into a tree stump. They would get scar tissue and fibrosing from all those sites. So now the needles are so fine, you don't find that. And so you know the sub-Q sites. Um, in particular, it's nice to give it into the belly. Um, and oftentimes the patient may ask you to give it in the back of the arm that they could not access. So um, be prepared to do that. 
Uh, so as you can see, these are the sites, the, the belly. I've never given it into the upper buttocks like that. I'm off, I would only have given it into the subcutaneous. And when I'm, when I measure, I make sure that I, I you had a landmark for those subcues. Did, okay, good. Just want to be sure of that. Um, uh, some of the things that you think of, do not inject into a site that's going to be exercised. So don't, don't give somebody insulin to the thigh and then ambulate them. Don't give someone insulin into their arm and then put a blood pressure cuff on it. Um, no alcohol swab is needed on the site before injection, although um, is that what Dana teaches you to use it in, to swab the site within, with alcohol and let it dry? I think that's a safe process. And you wear gloves when you do your insulin injection, correct? Yeah, good. Um, I just want to highlight, this is something that's, you know, goes around, comes around. So each, there are U100 syringes. Now, that means U100 means U, uh, that holds 100 units of insulin. There was a real problem years ago because the insulin syringes got all messed up and they had all these different syringes. So they knew that there was too many mistakes and went to one syringe. But if you've ever had to give one unit of insulin, I don't know if you tried to do that when you're in clinical, one unit of insulin, it's, it blinds you. It, it hardly, you, you think you'd have one, you'd have anything in the, it's in the, the barrel of the needle. So, it's, so they're now getting um, smaller syringes, U30 and U50. So be really careful with that. I just see that being an error. We went from that system because of the errors. I just see that's creating an error. And, and aside, you did see that, um, how do I say this delicately, the most recent um, trial or the CNOs uh, that, that the nurse had actually um, people with insulin um, as a result, that the nurse, uh, what, Weifenhauer, that was at the nursing homes, this is how she actually um, was inappropriately using the insulin, that's how she got charged. So I can't emphasize enough. I've seen where somebody um, made a mistake, and and um, again, this is all confidential. I'm I'm actually deleting these after you've got all your notes. Um, but a, a nurse that had, we used to have heparin. You know your saline locks. We used to actually use heparin in those. We didn't used to use saline until just recently. So we would heparinize them every morning at six o'clock in the morning, and we would use 100 units of heparin. So just a little bit, so it wouldn't clot. Somebody by mistake heparinized them and used 100 units of insulin. For an entire unit. So we, we can't take this lightly. We have to be very, very careful with the insulin. I always get someone to do a check, and I know that it's, you know, if someone's not watching, but it makes me do a, a stops me, but I, I get someone to always check my insulin heparin. And that's just something I've always done. There's no policy to say that. Lakeridge has the high alert medications, and if you're giving it to a pediatric patient, then you'd have to do it, but otherwise, no, you wouldn't have to. Um, hand washing with soap is adequate uh, for administering you no know, alcohols needed, just hand washing. Do not recap your needle. Watch those needles, they're very fine. And I've actually had, I wasn't recapping properly, and I straight through the side of the, the needle, right through the cap, because it's just so fine. It's just right through into my finger. Uh, at a 45 to 90 degree angle, and um, Insulin pens are preloaded. I find people who give me the, the pens, I have no idea what they want me to do with it. I don't know how to use them. And so I would only use a, a syringe that I'm used to, I've been trained on. Uh, drug therapy, uh, the side effects are hypoglycemia, allergic reaction, lipodrypso, lipodystrophy, which is that woody sites, Samogi effect and dawn phenomenon. And so Samogi effect. So just wanted to highlight, of course, don't give your insulin unless you know that the meal tray is coming. And could I also urge you that when you're giving insulin, that you know where the antidote would be. So there's always an order for anyone on um, insulin to, or a unit directive to give one, two, three dextrose tabs. Make sure that you have your dextrose tabs right there. You don't want to find that somebody used the last one and there's nothing there after you've given your insulin. The other thing that you can do is give D50W. So if a patient is becoming hypoglycemic, they'll say give 25 mils of D50W. Next time you're in the sim lab, I can show you that. Um, the Samogi effect, I just want to, it's, it's this uh, rebound effect of, uh, that happens during the sleep times. What happens is when you're sleeping, you know how you have that circadian rhythm happening? Well, as a result of the circadian rhythm, you end up getting, um, you, you get, um, 
your hormones, you've got epinephrine being released, and then your body will release, uh, give you, increases the glucose, and as a result, you get insulin. So you have all of this um, uh, insulin on board, and the sugar is already burned up, so you end up with a hypoglycemia in the middle of the night. So when I would do my nighttime rounds, uh, uh, I would take it, I had my flashlight, and I'd actually check to see if there's any diaphoresis on their brow. Hypoglycemia will cause some diaphoresis, on, uh, and they become very shaky. Um, just think about yourself at three o'clock in the afternoon when you've been working really hard, or even on your units when you didn't have the opportunity to go to break, and your stomach is grumbling, you've got the hangries, you just are irritable, hungry, tired, you can't think straight because there's no glucose in your brain, and you're shaking. This is how the patient will present, and they actually will be sweaty. Uh, oral agents work to uh, support the insulin that is being produced and so it will actually work on the three deficits so it will actually improve the, in, uh, you, the glucose utilization at the cell by decreasing insulin resistance it will also uh, decrease the insulin production and it will increase hepatic uh, glucose production so don't even worry about knowing all these names, but knowing that they all work differently. Some of them actually um, are, what are they, they're starch busters. So they actually will cause, they'll bind with the starch and get you to excrete it so that di you get diarrhea. So these are the medications that people say, you know, have a big, big meal and you can take these pills and you'll lose weight kind of thing because it binds with that, that um, glucose and you have diarrhea. Some of them will increase production from the, from the pancreas, increase production of, of insulin. Some of them are more of a fibery kind, creating more, um, more diarrhea. Uh, nutritional therapy is one of the, the hallmarks of of therapy for your patients with diabetes, really important for health promotion. And remember the health promotion starts the minute you go into the room. You don't wait till the last day and they're all going home. You're constantly doing it. And so, um, first of all, you could get a consult with the diabetic health educator or the diabetic nurse, get a referral. They'll come and, and sit with the patient. You might get a, a referral to a for a dietitian. But in the meantime, you can actually do some, th uh, some teaching yourself and you can get information at the website, the diabetic website. And so really, it's we used to have severely restricted diets. It was 1,000 calories a day. And, and we, then we'd say, that patient's non-compliant. They were on 12, they had a cookie. And so really very judgmental. And I, don't, and I don't know how they did it. Um, no wonder we had such poor control. Now we look at really just low glycemic low glycemic foods. So really helping them to select those foods that are going to not have that um, burst of sugar and really help them to, to have that higher fiber, lower, uh, more complex carbohydrates. That's, and we don't have a, a number of calories. Um, type 2 diabetes is really, a, because remember these are the people that are the, the rounder, rotund, they have the big bellies, we want calorie reduction. So anything is going to help them with reducing their calories. And remember those small changes in health promotion. Um, you want to help them achieve glucose, uh, better glucose levels, uh, bring their lipids down, might mean getting an order for a, for a statin. They should be really balancing their, their energy um, output with their uh, intake. Carbohydrates should be a low portion of their diet, um, with a low glycemic diet. Fat should be less than 7% of their diet. So no Atkins diet for them. And protein should be a greater portion of it. Although, again, remember that oftentimes they have other diseases like kidney dysfunction. So you have to be really careful with that. Uh, with the protein. Alcohol, we try not to because of the effects on the liver as well as um, on uh, a those are empty calories. We want to ensure that uh, we are helping them to live in a realistic world. So, so one of the things is that you they visualize the, the plate and that they have a a protein source that's the size of the hand, that they have a great half the plates, more vegetables, and a little portion of the starch. So that sort of thing that really is that sustained um, change. If you have to go, by all means, you, 
Thank you so much for staying. And anybody else who has to leave, by all means. And online, if you have to sign off, I get it. Um, and so exercise is really a key component. It uh, will increase insulin at the, uh, increase the glucose at the receptor sites, lowers the glucose. However, I want to caution you that uh, patients that are long-time runners, that they would need to do their glucose before they embark on their run, they will need to take supplements along the way because you don't want them becoming hypoglycemic as, they, as the muscles, skeletal muscles burn off all that sugar. Um, so exercise should be a slow, um, Merry Christmas. Uh, several carbohydrate meals can be taken every 30 minutes to prevent hypoglycemia. And a patient knows when they're hypoglycemic, they'll say, could you just get me the dextrose or get me some, get me uh, a Coke or something to that effect. And I've never, I learned this lesson so poignantly when a, a diabetic said to me, um, my, I need something, my sugar's really low. And I thought, well, then in those days we didn't have an AccuCheck. We actually had to send the blood down to the lab. I said, well, we the lab to come up and draw the blood and we'll get that. It took about an hour. And sure enough, the patient's blood came back at 2.9. So definitely they were hypoglycemic and they can tell that. They can tell that. So if they see they're hypoglycemic, I definitely believe them and I do what they, what they would normally do. Uh, monitor glucose before, during, and after exercise. Um, and we want to teach self-monitored blood glucose or using those AccuChecks, knowing that as a nursing student that you will probably not have the opportunity to do those AccuChecks because of the, it is a lab procedure. It comes out, it falls under the jurisdiction of the lab personnel, and that's why you don't do it. You need to be registered staff, and there needs to be um, quality control as well. Uh, I think we've talked about um, all of that. That's what a blood glucose monitor looks like, more or less. Um, and so there's, the technology is getting quite sophisticated now. Um, I think we've talked about the assessment already. We've talked about the signs of a patient presenting with uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, I think we've talked about this talked about uh, what the goal for therapy will be. Uh, we've talked about health promotion, really identifying those at risk. And I think that any, any of our youth that are spending a large portion of their time in front of the television, coupled with um, a diet high in fast food or complex carbohydrates, uh, are at higher risk of developing it. So really targeting those populations. Uh, I think we've talked about all of those situations. Surgery, if I could just take a quick moment here and talk about surgery. Patients presenting for surgery, um, it's a little bit different because they're NPO for whatever the procedure is, they're, they're NPO after midnight. So the doctor, we need to get an order. Um, so first of all, we're gonna monitor sugar very closely during the post-op period, but we need to get an order. Typically it would be half the morning insulin because they're not eating. However, their body is undergoing stress and they still produce all those hormones that will produce the sugar. And so uh, the stress of illness and sugar can increase your glucose level. The, you wanna get them back on their routine meals as soon as you can. And you want to increase that, their fluids. And they're saying to check their, their urine for ketone. We tend not to check for ketones, uh, but we're just more or less monitoring blood sugar. Uh, is there anything else? Oh, important. I don't think it's a test question, but it's really important to practice. Metformin, we talked about that with cardiac. Same thing here with diabetes, because metformin is an anti-diabetic agent. And so for patients undergoing surgery or other procedures, they, you need to hold the metformin for 48 hours because it can deteriorate into elastic acidosis. So that's an important thing to remember. I think we've talked about that. Um, just in terms of health promotion, we want the patient to be as independent as possible. Uh, one of the things that's really important, I don't see as often, is the medic alert. Years ago, we had everybody with a little medic alert bracelet or, or a, um, a neck, uh, necklace around their neck around medic alert, but at least they have to carry something in their wallet. Because if somebody comes along and finds them unconscious on the road, they may think that they're just drunk. And in fact, they're profoundly hypoglycemic. And if you go into an eMERGE department, 
if the patient is hypoglycemic, the first thing they do, or the, if the patient comes in unresponsive, the first thing they do is to check a sugar to rule out that they're um, unconscious from hypoglycemia. They, uh, so make sure they carry um, a card to say that they are diabetic. Uh, they need to be educated on the whole disease process, the, their activity, and just whatever their normal activity is, you know, encourage them to increase it because that's going to help with glycemic control. But they have to be careful how they do it. Just gradually get the doctor's permission or their healthcare provider or the, nurse, uh, the diabetic nurse's um, approval. Um, but they definitely need to balance their activity with their um, with their their insulin and their diet. Diet is really important, so have the diabetic um, educator or the dietitian speak with them, and have the patient very um, involved in their care, as well as their family. I know that our uh, a, a neighbor, their grandson was a type one diabetic, and the whole family went down to sick kids for training, so that when the young fellow stayed out with the grandparents, they even know what to do. They had the insulin in the sharps containers and everything. Uh, Again, you just want to, so nursing evaluation, and as we've all talked about a lot, that how, we always must evaluate any of our interventions, so making sure that the patient can do a demonstration. So we would teach them how to give insulin. I would demo it to them. Then they, then I would drop the insulin, and they would actually inject themselves. We do a stepped approach. Then they would actually draw it up, and I would inject it, or if they felt comfortable to inject it, and then they would continue, and I just supervise them after that. Um, we want to just make sure that this patient is providing uh, good care, that they're avoiding complications. The one thing I don't see here that I want to make sure is that in terms of health promotion, remember that all those apathies, I want to remind everyone that patients that are, are diabetic often don't ex experience pain the same. So they may so experience silent ischemia. So they may have um, myocardial and myocardial infarction and not experience pain. So always be alert that if a diabetic comes in with a complaint that you look to see that is it silent ischemia. The other thing is, is that uh, because of the high level of amputations, you want to make sure that they are providing, that they're doing very good foot care, that they're washing their feet every day with soap and water, drying well, examining between the toes to prevent any kind of gangrene setting in. Gangrene sets in very quickly, and it just, it, it starts with just a little black scab. It looks like a scab, and before you know it, the whole foot looks like a black banana. Is that soft, black, dead, and that can actually kill the patient if they're not amputated because of the um, byproducts that they can be septic very quickly. We talked about the complications of DKA and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome, and we've talked about hypoglycemia. Uh, we've talked about DKA. Um, and just an, another thing that you, is that when patients get sick, so they, they're at home with the flu, um, and part of your health teaching will say, if you do get the flu, you do need to continue your insulin. Try and get replacement with fluids like ginger ale or apple juice or something that it, it does have sugar in it, but they're not taking other carbohydrate sources, and then monitoring their sugar. And if their sugars are over, say, 10 um, for two consecutive checks, then they need to be seen in the emergency department. It's easier to deal with a patient that has a sugar that's reasonable, but because they come in with a sugar of 35, and then, it, then it's really a problem. Uh, we've talked about uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. We've talked about signs and symptoms. We've talked about all of that. Uh, we've talked about that. Um, We've, we've essentially talked about DKA, and as I said, they're parts dry, and we give them a lot of fluids. I just want to highlight that we would give them um, normal saline or half strength normal because they need volume. They're so parched. Uh, but about halfway through, when the sugar, we can't bring the sugar down. This is a good point. We can't bring the sugar down really fast, because you're thinking, well, if the sugar's 35, why not just give them, like, two syringes of insulin and bring the sugar down? It's because of the shifts in the electrolytes. And what will happen is if your sugar comes down too fast, it can create a neurological condition. So think about how um, sugar sort of holds the fluid. And so when your sugar gets high, it draws all the fluid into the brain. But if you drop it too quickly, it can cause um, too great of a shift and you end up with uh, brain swelling, et cetera. So we have to bring it down slowly. 
I think we've talked about all of this stuff. We've talked about, and for those of you at home, um, we've, we've, we've really talked about all of these situations at the level that you need to know at this point. And I think we've talked about that. We used to have really tight glycemic control. We used to really tighten that, so we want the sugars around four to six. We found that was unrealistic, and in fact, we were doing a worse job. Was, uh, patients were becoming sicker because the sugars were too low, and so we now just relax that. We've talked about that. We have talked about all of these pieces, um, and we've talked about that. Uh, and, and hypoglycemia, we talked about all of the different things that we should do, but I just want to highlight that the paramedics will carry uh, glucagon, which is a, is a hormone replacement and it's given inter, intramuscularly. And we've talked about all of these complications that occur. Ah, oh, that's a good test question. How often do diabetics need to have eye examinations? It's on an annual basis. So I think we've talked about all of this. It's really about the prevention. Oh, um, another important point around complications is sexual dysfunction. A lot of times, um, because of uh, nerve innervation, etc., they end up with sexual dysfunction, particularly men, uh, erectile dysfunction. And so there are different clinics downtown Toronto that will address these issues. I know that the first this fellow, the diabetic, that taught me about when they say they're hypoglycemic, they're hypoglycemic. He, and this is back many years ago when they didn't have the sophistication, he had a penile implant because he was a young man. And, and um, uh, so it, this is really something that we need to address with uh, our patients. There are consults that you can get available to urology or to this, the androgyny clinic at Sunnybrook. I think we've talked about all of these complications uh, and the important complications. So, first of all, I want to give you all a big round of applause. You are incredible. That you, very fact, you sat in here for all this information, and you're still you're still sitting. Your heads aren't hitting the computer. So, I want to thank you so much for staying. I hope that I've been able to share some important points here that will help you um, for the for the, the, the final exam, but going forward for your practice and for the NCLEX. Um, with diabetes, I think we've talked about some of the, the differences in, in type 1, type 2, pre-diabetes and gestational diabetes. We've talked about signs and symptoms that are different for each, and what are complications of each of those. We've talked about the medi medication or pharmacological interventions, and we've talked about the complications of diabetes in general and how to prevent that. Uh, we've talked about health promotion strategies and some of the other health professions, the interprofessional team that we need to consult with. Um, and we've talked about um, some of the, the, the nuances that you might experience in clinical. So I'm going to end on that note, thanking you very much for staying, wishing you all a very Merry Christmas. Uh, are you okay with me doing this on Friday, doing a Zoom? You can do it from home. Okay, so just I'm going to stop screen share and I'm going to wish everybody online a very happy Christmas and I will put all the instruction up on uh, on our website.